but um, yeah, so um, I'll just go through some of it, and you know, I'm happy to um, answer any questions. Thing, but um, in terms of sort of things that we see, you know, um, all of everyone. I'm not sure what all, everyone's role is here, but we see a fair amount of uh, different things here. I, I sort of in blue, I highlighted sort of the more uh, typical things that we'll see in Clubfoot, I think being the, the most uh, the most numerous uh, consults that we get. Limb deformity, be it length and alignment issues, uh, are certainly up there. Limb deficiencies, we've seen a few of those. And then this sort of amniotic band syndrome, I'll, I'll say, that we'll talk about a little bit at the very end. Uh, that's a little bit of a nebulous thing, but I think we've seen some of those as well. Other things that we can see, the dysplasias, uh, it's very difficult to sort of drill down uh, on the fetal uh, visit, but certainly there's some suggestion there. Um, more so the, um, I think in the fetal medicine literature at least, is, is being able to determine sort of um, dysplasias that are not going to be survivable versus ones that are, you know, survivable and, and trying to figure out exactly what they are. And that's sort of more where you are in the fetal medicine world. The spinal deformities, we certainly see some of those. Hand deformities, I'm not going to talk uh, about because that's not really my area of expertise. And, but certainly the simple things like polydactyly and syndactyly and missing digits are there. Um, the more complex uh, issues, you know, there hasn't been a lot of um, movement in the, in the field of prosthetics in the upper extremities as of recent. And so there's not a lot that we can offer in, in terms of real uh, um, uh, advanced prosthetics in the upper extremities. Now that's changing a little bit with all the uh, ad, with all the um, IED attacks in, in the Middle East and so the military is really pushing that forward. And so I think that over the past, over the next 10 to 15 years we'll see a real advancement in prosthetics in the upper extremities, but we're really not there yet. So I think that it's still a burgeoning field here, the growing field that we don't know a lot about or don't have a lot to offer. But those kids do do very well with missing upper extremities uh, as well. Uh, foot deformities, other joint abnorm abnormalities we see, but um, the big ones are sort of in blue there. So, um, you know, the ossification of the long bones typically happens by about the uh, end of the first trimester, and so usually that uh, skeletal evaluation by about 14 weeks gestation. The achondroplasia, which is the most common form of skeletal dysplasia that's, that we see, usually you don't see a, a changes or, or you can't get a good measurement of that until the third trimester. So I, I don't think that we see a lot because I think by the third trimester we're not doing a lot of too many of these fetal exams. It's usually earlier than, than that. But I'll, I'll talk about clubfoot a little bit, what it is, uh, how we treat it, and then what in the fetal medicine exam is important to us. So congen uh, clubfoot or congenital telepes, equinovirus, is this deformity of the foot. And it's broken down, if you haven't been in my uh, sessions that I talked to the families mm -hmm. about, into four different um, sort of deformities of the foot. So there's cavus of the, of the forefoot, which is this sort of very hyper-arched uh, uh, forefoot. There's adductus of the forefoot, so the toes are way turned in, so like hyper-intoeing. There's varus of the hind foot, so the whole hind foot is sort of turned in as well and equinus of the hind foot. So if all the other deformities were not there, you'd have a very tight heel cord so they'd be up on their tiptoes. All four of those deformities are present and give you this foot that's sort of turned up and in where the bottom of the foot is sort of pointed up to the butt almost in the, in the worst case, okay? And so when we think about those four deformities, that's how we think about them so we can correct those in a sort of sequential fashion. The incidence of us 0.2% in live birth, so it's fairly common. And there's different there's different ones. There's idiopathic, which really is there. Normal children doesn't resolve without treatment. There's this quote unquote postural um, deformity, which is basically positional, or we say sort of a packaging problem where they're where they're where they're packaged in there. Those sort of resolve without casting, or or maybe one or two casts, and I, they're not really true club feet. I mean, they get mixed up in the literature, but those are more of a sort of just a packaging problem that sort of gets better over time. And then there's neurogenic, kids with, with myelomeningocele, um, and then um, syndromic, so kids with Beal syndrome or, or um, 
or things like that, they have these very rigid, resistant club feet to treatment um, uh, that you can see, okay? I, amyoplasia is, is another one. So, like I said, you see this up on the upper left-hand side where the foot is way turned in. You have this very, um, very big medial crease from the foot that's very hyper, hyper uh, cavus, a uh, big, big arch there, and it's way turned up and in. And usually if it's unilateral club foot, that whole side is affected. So it's not just the foot, it's the whole side. And the whole side is smaller. The muscles in the, in the back of the leg and the thigh are smaller than the other side all throughout life. Usually that foot's about a size to a size and a half smaller all throughout life. So you're going to have to be buying different size shoes, which sometimes can be more disappointing to the families in the fetal medicine visit than, than the fact that they have the club feet. Uh, and they ask where they can buy these shoes for their unborn child. Um, but, you know, th that's sort of something that you have to deal with. It's not a thing that you're going to notice unless you notice it. Uh, I mean, uh, unless you're buying the shoes, you typically don't notice it, but it's certainly something that they'll complain about. So the goal is a plantar grade, supple, sort of painless foot that works and, and all that and, and doesn't have any problems. There's a bunch of different ways you can do it. Um, casting is sort of the mainstay. That's the Ponsetti method developed by uh, Dr. Ponsetti out in Iowa. But there's other methods that work. Uh, there's a physical therapy and taping method, so-called the French uh, method, and that's a very labor-intensive process where in the first month or two, these kids come in the hospital every day and they get physical therapy and they get that almost like kinesio taping where they tape the foot. Then they come back the next day and they do it again Sometimes they add a, a very small mini uh, continuous passive motion machine at home that they strap the foot in and try to do that. It's a very effective method. They do it in France quite a bit. Uh, they, they had the program at my, the place that I trained in fellowship and, and people like it. it. It tends to shy uh, towards people that are more naturopathic and, and they really like a hands-on approach because the parents do the stretching at home. Uh, but it works quite a bit, and it's a very similar concept to the casting method where you're just gradually stretching the foot out, stretching the medial tight structures out. But as I said, labor intensive. In this day and age, it doesn't reimburse very well, so people don't tend to do it. But in terms of the Ponsetti method, it's basically the same sort of thing in a little bit less um, uh, daily fashion where you're just gradually stretching the foot out, okay? And and what you see, like, like I said, um, the, the whole forefoot, which is this, is way medial. This is medial. Here's the tibia and here's the fibula. The, um, navic or the um, talus, this is the tailor head. The navicular should be square on the tailor head, but it's way displaced medial. So the whole forefoot is sort of displaced medial on the foot, and the, and the toes are supinated or they're turned way in, okay? So they're turned way up. And so the whole idea is to use this head of the talus, which is right here, as a fulcrum point, and you sort of bring the whole forefoot around the head of the talus. And when you do that, you can bring the foot into a more normal position. You can swing the hind foot. Here's the heel bone. That comes into a more normal position. And if you do that gradually and stretch out these medial structures, you can do that and hold that. So it's rotated around the head of the talus. And that's what we tend to do. So we, we, um, we have to sort of, because the foot's in that cavus, that big high arched we have to push that first metatarsal up to get that uh, foot a little bit flatter. And then as we gradually bring that foot around the head of the talus, like you see here where your thumb is on the head of the talus, you can bring that foot all the way around. And you do this over the course of a number of weeks. So you stretch out the foot, you hold it there for a little bit, and then you put a plaster cast on to hold it for a week to stretch things out. You come back and you do it again. And gradually, here's in the hind foot, you see the foot is in what we call, it, the hind foot's in varus, where, it's, where the heel bone is pointed way in like this. Here's the medial structure again. And as you bring that whole forefoot around, this, this, um, for, this hind foot can swing back into a more neutral position, so your foot is more straight up and down. So here's what we have. Here's where it starts, and then five weeks later, you have the foot that's way swung out. And it's just simply stretching, putting a cast on. You see gradually, as the weeks go by, you have this foot that's sort of stretched out into a more derotated position, and you can hold it with casts, and that's over five weeks. Usually takes about five to seven weeks to, um, to correct this. 
um, and, and you do, it's, it's about a 15 to 20 minute clinic visit where you come in, you stretch the foot, you put a new cast on, and then they're good to go. Um, it doesn't really bother the kids. Uh, after a cast or two, they pretty much get used to it. They don't, they don't really get affected by it too much other than the, the taking the cast off when you have to use the saw. They don't really love that. Um, but other than that, you stretch that foot out and they do, and they do very well with it. Uh, at the very end, the one thing that we don't do a very good job with with the casting is that um, tight heel cord. Um, and that's because there are so many joints in the foot um, that when you go to try to push the foot up and stretch out the heel cord, typically what happens is you just create what we call a rocker bottom foot where we just stretch through these joints in the forefoot. And so instead of stretching the heel cord, you just stretch through the foot and you get this foot that's like that, this sort of rocker bottom foot. So because of that, and the difficulty with stretching out in the cast, about 90% of the time we need to do a, a tenotomy where we just cut the Achilles tendon at the end of casting. And we do that right in the office. We do a little bit of uh, emla cream in the back of the heel with just a little percutaneous cut. Uh, it's very superficial. We cut the tendon um, and then don't even need a stitch. You just hold some pressure put the cast back on for three weeks and the, and the tendon heals back up. Within about two weeks, they've done some ultrasound studies, the tendon heals back in about two weeks in an elongated fashion. Do you cut through the whole tendon or you just partially? Cut? No, we cut through the whole the tendon, whole yeah. There's such a thick um, peritinon around it that it basically has a track to sort of grow back. And like I said, the ultrasound studies show about, about two weeks later, the tendon's intact. So we leave them in that last cast for three weeks just leave it there and the tendon heals back. Yeah, so that gets the foot up into a, a norm, more normal position. Um, so you start here where the foot is way turned in and then you bring them all the way out over, over correcting them because eventually they sort of come back a little bit over time and so they get to a more normal position. It's a, what we tell people is that it's a lot of uh, in labor intensive up front where we're doing the work. Every, you know, every week you gotta come back, but it's very effective. What the benefit of this is compared to surgery from before is that it keeps the foot nice and supple. There's no real scarring there. The foot is movable uh, and it's nicely corrected and they really do quite, quite well from it over time. Um, the outcomes are quite good um, with a caveat here. Initially, the correction rate is in, is in the high 90s. I mean, the average about 95% you can correct it. This is all comers, so it doesn't matter the severity of the foot with the casting method, whether it's five casts or seven casts, you can get the foot corrected. That's not really a problem. The problem is once you get the foot corrected, the foot does want to come back into a club foot position. And so after we correct them, we use a set of braces that they use. And the braces are worn full time, 23 and a half hours a day for about four months and then part-time just at night until they're about four years old. And so they keep it stretched out at night. Um, the recurrence rate is directly proportional to the use of the braces. And so with non-adherent um, families, which we have a fair number of them, you get a fair number of relapses. And so the relapse rate is somewhere between, you know, 40 to 50% of kids will come back at some point with some relapse. We can continue to cast them after they relapse, but obviously if they're two years old, it's much more difficult so psychosocially to get them casted. And so a lot, uh, you know, about two thirds of these kids that come back will require some sort of surgery uh, to uh, correct the foot because of the relapse. And the, re and the use of the brace is directly proportional to socioeconomic factors. There've been a num number of studies. So level of education, you know, uh, income, uh, you know, you can relate it to geographic location of where you live that, that is directly related to that. And so we have non-compliant families that are non-adherent and they come back and the kids have a, a relapse of the club foot and they end up with repeat casting. And then you can imagine how compliant they are with that at two or three years old. And so a lot of these kids that relapse have a difficult time with it uh, because it's, it's problematic. The pro but, and, and so we do a lot of upfront work, but it's us and they come back to us and then the real, the real work starts once we correct the foot and you gotta keep them in the braces and, and that becomes a difficult problem for them. 
So Why is it relapse? Is it because of skeletal uh, changes, or is it tone? No, they've they've done you know they've done biopsy studies of these kids, and they and the muscle is abnormal. There's these myofibroblasts that are sort of within the muscle, so it's the whole limb. There, there's some developmental oh. abnormality within the way that the muscles uh, are, are, and so they're not normal skeletal muscle. They have mm -hmm. this this sort of uh, myofibroblasts that are in it, and so they become. Uh, re, they retighten back up, and then you get this repeat deformity for whatever reason. And it doesn't respond to Botox. Uh, simple Botoxing, I don't know. I don't know if anyone's ever tried that, to tell you the truth. Yeah. And, but you would think the thigh musculature is all well. Thigh musculature, the gastrox soleus muscle, all smaller than the other side. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So not, it, you know, that's sort of the uh, one of the million dollar questions, exactly what is this that happens and, and why? I mean, everything that they've looked at are all abnormal, the vessels, the nerves, the muscles. I mean, they're all abnormal in some way, so exactly what ties it all together, we're not, not 100% sure. And the bones normal size, the femur, the uh, hip? Uh, I don't know that. I, that's a good question. I mean, the foot's smaller, the foot's smaller, so, uh, you know, by size, so the the bones are probably smaller there, but but there's not a, no, a limb length discrepancy associated with it. And shoes, so you said bracing, but do they have to wear special shoes as well? So special shoes are not, no. So, you know, so if you all told, if they come in about a week or two, after, uh, you know, of life, and you cast them for six weeks, and then you do the tenotomy, and then the, the last cast is on for three weeks. That's about eight to nine weeks of casting. And then you put them in the, the braces, which are like Birkenstocks with a little bar attached to them, so they're these sandals. They're in those full time for about four months. So by six months, they're, they're only in their boots and bars, their shoes at night. And so they're, they should be able to get crawling and sort of get back to their regular developmental uh, status. Usually, there have been some studies about their development. They're about one to two months delayed. So, that, so if the normal walking age is 12 months, they usually start walking by about 14 months. Uh, but then they quickly catch up. So once they're actually weight-bearing, uh, the need for bracing falls away? The need for bracing during the day falls away. So they're up, they're putting pressure on it, they're sort of stretching things out mm -hmm. as they go. Uh, but at night, we keep them in the braces just to give them a little bit of stretch at night so they don't sort of tend to come back. Yeah. And if it's bilateral, you go through the process bilaterally? Bilateral, you do, yeah, two, two cast, yeah. And and even if it's unilateral, the the shoes are such that there's this bar that connects them, so they're, they're in both of the shoes with the bar. One is just sort of pointed out a little bit more than the other one, so bilateral, unilateral. By, by age five or ten, are both feet still different? Size or are they? Yeah, they remain different sizes forever. Usually about a size, size and a half difference in shoes. Yeah, yeah. So what do they do? They have to buy two different shoes? Yeah, I mean, there's some. There. Yeah, that's the thing that freaks people out. So there's some places that are. Yeah, so like Nordstrom will sell you two different size shoes. Shoe train will sell you two different size shoes. So there are some, uh, there are some, you know, shoe stores that will sell you two different size shoes. It should be a blog for the families, you know, one kid with a right foot, the other yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, I'm not kidding. No, no, that's a good, that's a good yeah, a, a swap. So a swap, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. There's that, and, and the, the braces are another thing is that, you know, typically the braces need to be changed about, th they probably outgrow about three in the first year, and then, and then every, you know, sort of nine months thereafter, so nine to 12 months. So these braces, they don't recycle them either. I mean, you know, and so the, it's a it's a money, it's a pretty big money-making thing for some of these companies. And there are families that have come back and said, listen, I mean, a lot of them have said, I never wore them, so you can have these back, they're brand new. But, you know, I mean, there's, there's probably a pretty good market to recycle those sort, sort of braces. So we, we have a lot of them just sort of in a box downstairs. But um, so, so that's that's sort of where we are, um, and and then on on ultrasound, you know, the long axis of the foot and the tibia are not normally in the same plane. As you can see, here's the up, up here, here's the tibia and fibula, and then the foot is sticking straight out at us because normally it's at right angle to each other. So you have the foot in a different plane. In the club foot, when it's turned up and in, this is the sort of path. Uh, pathognomonic picture that you get where you have the tibia and fibula, fibula and the foot all in the same plane and you know that's turned up and in and so they're, they're, that's the look that you get uh, with the club foot. 
there have been some attempts at looking at what the pre, you know, prenatal diagnosis and severity. And so one of the scales that we use or that has been published is, okay, what's the angle uh, subtended by the tibia and the long axis of the foot? And, you know, if it's under 80 uh, degrees here, it's sort of mild. If it's turned a bit more, it's moderate. If it's more than 100, it's severe, because normal should be sort of straight away. And there's really no correlation between the prenatal classification and the postnatal severity. And it may be that's, that's just too um, that not fine of a scale to show it. Or there's, like I said, there's so many different deformities, these four different deformities that you're just trying to break it down into this one angle and it doesn't really give you everything about it. The false positive rate, that's really much more uh, significant, at least prenatally. It's about 7% for those classified, even as moderate to severe. So there is a fair number of false positives in the literature. And, and if that's you, related to just positional change? Probably so, yeah. yeah. And, and I'll show you, and the timing of the diagnosis as well. Um, and so if you look, the false positive rate is anywhere between 0% to upwards of, you know, 17%. And, um, and it, it depends a little bit on the bilateral versus unilateral. So unilateral diagnoses have a much higher false positive rate than bilateral, okay? And then, um, and then this, this complex versus simple. So simple, if this is the only thing you see on the ultrasound versus complex where there's some other abnormality, obviously uh, much, much greater accuracy when it's a complex diagnosis, when there's something else associated with it, when it's just a single club foot. So the timing of the diagnosis seems to matter. There's much higher false positive rate in the first and third trimester, probably from different mechanisms. The first, either those are there or it's just positional on the ultrasound and, and they, or they can grow out of it possibly. And the third trimester, because it's a, I guess, less accurate diagnosis because they're sort of packaged in there tighter. The second trimester seems to be the sweet spot in terms of diagnosis, complex versus simple. If it's the only abnormality seen, then, then certainly a much higher false positive rate. And then aneuploidy uh, associated with clubfoot, there's an overall rate of about 3.6% in the one study that sort of looks at it overall. But with complex diagnosis, there's a much higher rate of, of issues with the chromosomes there. So, and that was that a study from a tertiary care center. And that aneuploidy, was that with unilateral or bilateral? Or uh, that was mostly bilateral. Bilateral, yeah. that Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, do we have a rate? Um, th there's only oh, with this 3.6%. Um, that's what I would say is the best that we have. That's not just unilateral, but that's sort of all comers. This one where they had 30%, those were all bilateral cases. That's interesting because very often with isolated, I don't talk about aneuploidy. Right. I, I think that's reasonable. Love, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, I think it's reasonable. I mean, there's nothing to suggest that there's some rate that we know of in the unilateral club, but yeah. And that number doesn't surprise me, thinking about anaphylady, just the percentage with the club foot as an anomaly picked up. I mean, it just, it fits right into all the percentages we would quote. Yeah. So. So this, this rate where they looked at this complex diagnosis at a tertiary care center, complex bilateral, that's when, the, in this article, they suggest you start talking about it. Otherwise, there's no, you know, no real reason. So what, what do we want to know? I would say, you know, the classification or the severity is not all that important to me, and mainly because the, the classification system is not very good. Uh, and then, and I can basically cast out any severity. I mean, with really little difference in the clinical course, maybe one or two weeks of casting, but, that, but it doesn't really matter to me too much. The, the trimester of the mother unilaterally versus bilaterally, these may be more important to talk about false positive rates. And then is it simple versus complex? You know, that, just, that impacts the discussion of the health of the fetus and, and whether uh, other, um, uh, other things need to go into looking at it. So those are the things that matter to me um, uh, when, when we talk about it. Uh, shortening of, of the long bones, um, you know, can be a normal variant. Uh, uh, there's some uh, information that maybe in some of Hispanic and Asian populations, the femoral lengths are a bit uh, shorter than, than the published uh, norms. Uh, and then is there some associated issue of diabetes or some other abnormality? Um, there is a way to predict the ultimate limb length discrepancy. So um, a drawer Paley, who's a who's a orthopedist who used to be in Baltimore, now is in Florida. They they 
put, a, put together these multipliers where you can take the length of the, of the long bone, multiply it uh, by these multipliers depending on the gestational age, and you can get an estimation at birth of how long those long bones will be. And then there's another multiplier for postnatal, and you can multiply that again, and you can get a prediction at what their legs are going to be, how long their legs are going to be at birth, okay? I mean, you start to get into... Is this good for upper extremity? Uh, they probably have one for upper extremity because I know they have a postnatal one for upper extremity, so they certainly, I bet, have one for um, uh, for uh, upper extremity. It, it just gets a, you know it just gets a little too much. And then when you when the other complicating factors, then you start talking about centimeters, and then the first question is, well, how much is that in inches? And and, and it just becomes a lot of numbers. And so I might you know you start to get into the weeds a little bit here, but you can if you wanted to predict exactly how much. Uh, they're going to be a discrepant. Uh, discrepant. Um, long bone deficiency is is um, is a topic that has, we have seen, and the three big ones are the. Now they talk about congenital femoral deficiency, congenital tibial deficiency, congenital fibula deficiency. The old school terms are proximal focal femoral deficiency, tibia and fibular hemiamelia. Those are the three big long bone deficiencies. And really, the treatment is based on the length of the limb, the function of the joint, and what the foot looks like. And, and I'll just go through some of the treatments here just so you have an idea about it. But Can I just ask you, yes. just to be sure, we're talking about the limb length discrepancy one side against the other, not the discrepancy from all of them. One side versus the other, yeah. But you can have bilateral. Well, yeah, so, so limb length discrepancy, you can, you can have one, you can have Discrepancy based on just growth on, you know, the uh, underlying diagnosis of the child, that sort of thing. Um, or you can have a deficient limb, so you can have some sort of congenital abnormality that's causing one versus the other. But in these multiplier methods, it's one versus the other. So you can multiply both sides and get one versus the other and see what the discrepancy is. Right. So congenital femoral deficiency is, a, as, it, as it says, a deficiency of the femur. The consistent findings are you have a short femur, you have this externally rotated thigh, okay, you have this rotation of the femur that causes the, the, the leg to be pointed out. You have valgus of the distal femur, so you have this, you have this knock knees of the, of, the, of the distal femur. And then you usually have some sort of ligamentous insufficiency of the knee. So usually you have an ACL deficient knee as well. Then there's some variable issues too. You can have bad uh, hip dysplasia or even complete absence of the proximal femur, as you see here. You can have a pseudoarthrosis between the proximal femur and the distal femur. Some, <coughs> some issue with the knee, a flexion deformity or real stiffness of the knee. And then you can also have uh, missing fibula or other parts of the lower extremities. That's, that's much more variable. And what you see is this very, very short leg compared to the other side. It's short. The hip and the knee often are functionally not great. And there's other lower extremity abnormalities, so you can have foot issues, you can have um, missing uh, fibula, so you can have some uh, instability of the, of the um, ankle as well. The, the, all of these deficiencies, and this goes, this goes with the upper extremities too, these kids are, by all other measures, normal. I mean, I have a kid that looks exactly like this, and he's eight years old, and he came in and he said, oh, I just finished up with uh, my flag football season. I mean, this is what his lower extremities look like. Normal team, it's not like a handicap team. And so these kids, they're born with it, they walk around, they, they play football, they do whatever they want, whether they're missing their upper extremities or lower extremities. And so that, that's the one thing that you, can, that you try to get through as parents is, listen, that's going to be there, we can, we can help fix that, but these kids otherwise are going to be pretty normal. And so uh, that's something to consider. There's lots of classifications, and you can go from missing the femur totally to just having a very uh, slight difference. And, you know, this is the easiest classification and really becomes the most functional one as well in terms of what to do. It, you can have a limb that's short, but it sort of re release, or goes all the way down below the knee. So it's sort of short, but not too short. Those are kids you can lengthen the femur, and you can get pretty much back to where it needs to be. Usually it's about it's greater than 50% normal length. You can have a very short limb, which is less than 50% length. Those are usually better served with some sort of prosthesis because the lengthening procedure is so arduous. You have to get so much length 
that is problematic because you're looking at about 20 centimeters of length that you have to get back. Um, and then you can have a really short femur, uh, which is way above the knee, and um, usually the hip is totally uh, absent in this. And again, those are better uh, served with a prosthesis because the reconstruction is just too much for the kid. And so um, when you have a short leg, but it's, it's lengthened, you can, you can put these kids in a prosthesis early on where their foot just slips into the prosthesis and they can, they can just go with that. It's almost like a very long le uh, limb that they can step into. You can sh slow down the growth of the other side, so-called contralateral prosthesis, and then lengthen this shorter leg, but it usually takes two or three surgeries to do that. And it usually is about a month per centimeter in this contraption that you have to do. So if you're talking about 10 centimeters, um, you're talking about about 10 months of lengthening, and you can you can only get about five centimeters per time. So you're talking about two or three different surgeries where you're in this contraption for five or six months. So, so what do you put in between bone, or you just um, right then? You cut the bone, and then you have um, you have um, fixation below and above this. This piece was up here, and then as it's almost like you cut the bone and you wait a little bit, and the body starts to heal the bone back. And then at about a week after you cut it, you start to gradually distract the bone. And so that healing, that callus, starts to stretch, almost like taffy. And you do it real slow, about a millimeter a day, and you stretch. And so as the bone tries to heal that break, you can pull the bone, pull the bone, and then you get to where you want, and then you lock it down, and then you have that very immature callus that's been stretched, and then that gradually ossifies and turns into bone. Into good bone. Into oh. normal bone. That's wow. the one thing about bone, it heals back with normal bone, not scar tissue or anything, it heals back with totally normal bone. Wow. But what age do you usually? So it depends. If some people do it, try to do it real young, the problem is that this really, you have to, in my training, at least, you have to have some buy-in from the patient, I mean, to have this contraption on. And when you start getting real young, you start to have problems with the kid becoming an issue uh, with it. So I think by about age eight is about the earliest that we tend to put these uh, devices on to lengthen the bone. Um, and so you're talking about eight, 12, and then if you're going to have to do three, then usually one, like, at the end of growth as well. And so... In the meantime, you're looking at some sort of prosthesis to try to get them through. Um, and then you can do all sorts of things if, you, if, if you're really short. So you can, um, you, can disart, you, know, you can start to fuse the knee and then take the foot off, and then they're in a through knee amputation, you know, essentially. You can fuse the hip, and then the knee joint becomes the hip joint, and the, and the foot joint becomes the, the ankle joint becomes the knee joint. You can do a rotation plasty where you fuse everything and then you turn the foot around. And so now, you know, plantar flexion of the foot becomes extension of the knee and dorsal flexion of the foot becomes flexion of the knee um, with a prosthesis. That's the so-called rotation plasty where you have this foot that's on backwards, but it become, becomes a functional knee joint for the kid. And so you can do a lot of, of, of issues. And a lot of times these kids do better because they get into a prosthesis, they get they get going, and they're not having repeat surgeries every two or three years. Uh, with that's a major uh, issue for them. Fibular hemiamelia, same sort of uh, same sort of issue. You have a short or absent fibula. You have ACL deficiency. You have alignment issues with the knee. You usually have sort of a bad foot and ankle, this so-called ball and socket joint, and oftentimes you have deficiencies of the foot as well. So you're missing rays of the foot on the lateral side of the foot. Um, and really, what we ask is three things. What does the foot look like? What's the overall discrepancy going to be? And then what are the upper extremities look like as well? Because the treatment options, if, if, if the foot is good, you have, you have a good foot, meaning you have at least three rays on the foot, you try to save the foot and you try to lengthen the, the short leg. And you can lengthen and you can slow the other side down to try to get that foot. But if it's a good foot, you try to keep that leg. If it's a bad foot, if it's a two-rayed foot that's in a lot of valgus and it looks terrible and it's not going to be functional, then even if you get the leg out long, the foot's not going to be very worthwhile. And so if you do an amputation and you put them in a below-knee prosthesis, then they do much better than trying to reconstruct that foot. 
And then the only caveat is that if you're missing upper extremities, whatever the foot looks like, you, you keep the legs, you keep the foot because those kids use their feet as, as hands. And in fellowship, we had a clinic, amputation clinic, and these kids would come in like this and they would, um, you know, they've been going for a long time to this clinic. They would come in and they would draw pictures and they would paint. And they, they're, again, these kids are as functional as any other kids and, and oftentimes have very significant um, uh, abilities that you wouldn't imagine because they're just sort of hyper-motivated. And so those kids do very well as well. Um, Tibial hemiamelia, same thing. You're basically missing a tibia. The one thing that, that I would say that, and we've seen this before, is that this is the fibula here. When you're missing the tibia, the tibia is the major bone that makes up the ankle joint. And so oftentimes the feet are normal in these kids with tibial hemiamelia, but the foot looks like a severe club foot because they're missing the whole medial tibia there. And so the foot is swung into this equinovarus position. So I've had kids referred to me for club feet postnatally that have had this and they're just missing the tibia. And I think there's at least one that we, that we called a club foot that was a tibial hemiamelia. So um, that's, uh, that's something. Um, the classification is based on what the tibia looks like. So you can have a tibia that's totally absent and those kids are treated by a through knee amputation. You can have a, a tibia that's, ab that's there but unossified at birth and, and that's where you have to, that's where maybe the prenatal sort of diagnosis can help us out because I'll oftentimes get an ultrasound of those kids to see if there's a tibia there. Because in those kids, you can take the fibula and fuse it to that distal part of the tibia and, it, and you can have a much longer lever arm. So if you, if you have a prosthetic, it's much better if you have one that doesn't involve the joint. So if you can maintain your knee joint, it's a much easier prosthetic for people to have. And then, and then depending on, um, if it's just a distal part of the tibia or if it's diastase and the foot is way up in this diastasis, typically an amputation for those kids. Um, and so for these deficiencies, the, the things that we want to know are, you know, which bones are, are missing. It helps us narrow the diagnosis. What do the joints look like? If the knee joint is severely uh, contracted or the hip joint is a mess, that gives us a much better idea of what the reconstruction is. And then what do the feet and arms look like? Because that helps with the discussion of function. Um, of, these, of these kids. So I, I don't want to steal the thunder, but you know, she's kept this list up and I just went through it. We've had 13 kids with these sort of lower extremity deficiencies over the past couple of years. Nine of them have followed up. And just sort of looking at what, you know, very high level what we've, what we've seen, two of the kids have been found with congenital femoral deficiencies and pretty much both were correctly diagnosed on the ultrasound and they pretty much both had classic findings with that. Um, there are, just skip down here, two with, with congenital tibia deficiencies, one with correctly diagnosed and one was diagnosed with this bilateral club feet. And so um, I think that that's helpful to know. Um, we've had three that have been found with tibial bowing. And, um, and that seems to be a, a, a diagnosis, at least prenatally, that causes some trouble um, because none of them were sort of correctly diagnosed as just tibial bowing. Um, there were, all three of them were t said to have abnormal alignment, two of them with possible amniotic band, two of them with possible atypical club feet. So it appears that just bowing of the tibia really tends to sort of um, be difficult in terms of uh, seeing if it's just bowing versus some other abnormality. And so it may be worthwhile as we, you know, things that don't fit into a category to sort of say, all right, is this just bowing of the tibia versus, versus something else? Um, and then two of the patients found with amniotic band, um, they just sort of had multiple abnormalities that, again, didn't really fit into any, any classic bucket. And they, they didn't have, like, amputations from the amniotic bands either. I mean, they had their extremities, but they just had these multiple other abnormalities that were found. And um, that seems to be a sort of diagnosis that's difficult to pin down. And it may be because that's more of a diagnosis of exclusion more than anything. So I do think that there's something to sort of be said by looking at these more and saying, all right, can we sort of figure out these ones that are difficult to diagnose um, and how we sort of look at those. So um, that, that's, that's what we found. Just in terms of counseling, there's really little data on that. Um, 
mo as I said, most of these abnormalities can be managed pretty well with little long-term functional deficit. I mean, there's obviously the cosmetic deficit and the issue of having to get um, uh, um, prosthesis and things like that, but functionally these kids do well. We're currently, thanks to your guys' help, starting this randomized study of how we counsel kids with club feet and just to determine what the impact of our counseling is and how we can more, uh, how we can structure our counseling better that so everyone sort of does it a very similar way and we get to the family what they want to know. Because we really don't know what they want to know and we really don't know what's very helpful to them and I think that that'll be hopefully helpful as we move forward. So club foot, as I said, severity, not really that important, but other abnormalities are because there's a chance of false positive. Um, the limb deficiency is, is really the joints and the feet. That's what we need to sort of know um, and then um, I think that um, when it's not easily diagnosed, uh, we think of Boeing and amniotic band. Um, so that's that's what that's what I have for you. Hopefully that helps. No, that that was excellent. Um, I guess two questions just for referrals. So very often we're stuck with having to scan in the third trimester. So it may be fine for them to be meeting, but we, we always struggle, and, and that's where I think with a part tibial and Amelia's weakness. So is there, do you feel comfortable talking to them earlier, or why are we seeing them so late? Is it just referral? I think some of them are referred later just because parents want to kind of defer the conversation, not realizing the implications that imaging can help or hinder diagnosing prenatally. Um, I guess yeah. it's good to have in your mindset that for us, you know, we'll scan them at any time, but if we just struggle, and particularly when they're in the third trimester, they all have a little bit of mess right. with the doctors, and they're just kind of curved, and uh, it's, we, we do depend on yeah. the study. Um, vertical talus, I know, is pretty much um, associated more highly associated with anomalies. Yeah. Is, there a, is it more difficult to treat those? Yeah, vertical tail is much more difficult to treat. Uh, you, the, it's that's a surgical thing that you have. I mean, we we cast those just to help loosen up some of the soft tissues that are very tightly contracted in those, um, because oftentimes the perineals are very tight, um, and so when you try to um, reduce the forefoot on the tail, as um, you have to lengthen those soft tissues. If you cast them beforehand, you can stretch those out, and so you can sort of decrease the amount of surgery you have to do. But to get the forefoot reduced on the talus and get the talus back up, it's a surgical thing. Um, I, I, it's, that's one of the harder things to treat in my book. That, I mean, because you, ha you start early, but then when you go to, to do surgery, everything's, there's nothing really ossified. It's all cartilage still, and so you're really difficult to see, to see what's going on there. Um, I, I think that more and more, we, we should probably use some ultrasound to sort of try to figure out a little bit better how we're doing with the casting, where things are, um, but I don't think we're there yet. I mean, it's, it's still really cast to loosen up the foot, let the kid get a bit bigger, and then try to get things back aligned back up. But that's a very difficult uh, diagnosis to treat in my book. And I think we would like to push that forward, but it may be something where we'd like you in the room with us, and that might help us to yeah. get better. Yeah, I think that would be good. Any questions from the audience out in Netherlands? Yeah. <laughs> okay, anyone else have any questions? Thanks. Yeah. 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 No, I think it's been good. I mean, I think it's been, I think it's been helpful. Like I said, I think as we work through this study, it'll be even more helpful to see what we're doing in terms of counseling and yeah. if it seems to, you know, we're going to take people that have not been diagnosed prenatally and sort of get a measure of their, um, how they're feeling when they first come in and then and then kids that were diagnosed prenatally, get an, uh, ask them how we did and then how they felt on their first visit to see us and just see if, they, if there are questions that we missed, if there are things that people that didn't get counseled wish they had heard before, just so we can get a better idea exactly what we're doing because a lot of these, you know, there's enough on club feet that they can read a fair amount before they come in, and a lot of people know a lot about it. And so sometimes you wonder exactly what you're, what right. you're doing to help them. But, you know, it, it, I think it's 
much better to get a get an idea that than not. But I, mean, I think that's great, particularly from the study of special a lot more. But there's the old. You're clearly not one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You're clearly not one of those. Um, and we do have a couple um, radiology residents here, so we we read a lot of the X-rays afterwards. So when you're doing the, um, what are things that you're looking for when you get your images, or when you're doing the elongations, um, this amount during of the application. yeah during the, the yeah. elongation. Well, I mean uh, the things are um, the. Hit loosening of the pins or, or some fixation issues. I mean, I think that those are the things that I will typically look at because you want to make sure uh, that you don't have any of that. The callus formation can be a bit variable, and during the lengthening process, as long as there's something there, you're okay. And then the, when you stop the lengthening and you look for it to sort of uh, mature, then you start worrying about that, but as long as it's there. The pin loosening, the other thing that's really important is the joints above and below because the things that really can mess you up is that as you lengthen, like on a tibia, as you lengthen, um, obviously the gastrox go above the knee joint that attach to the femur. And so you can get posterior subluxation of the knee because the gastrox don't sort of get stretched out. So they remain tight and you're lengthening the tibia and that muscle doesn't lengthen with the tibia as much. And so you start to get some, some anterior subluxation, I guess, of the knee joint because that the, the gastrox remain tight. And so if you see joint subluxation, uh, then that's real problematic. So you either have to stop the lengthening and do therapy to get that back, or sometimes you have to, if it's really severe, you have to take them back to the OR and extend the frame above the knee and get control of the knee so you don't subluxate the knee. So for me, it's the fixation and then the joints above and below. Usually, I, I mean, usually we do. Uh, to, and it's the knee. And it's the knee. Yeah, or the hip. I mean, if you're doing a femur, yeah, the hip can sublux as well. Yeah, so those are the things that, that really uh, become. And we had, even with the, I had a kid that I had the internal, you know, the, the uh, now we have the internal fixation devices where you can lengthen just intramedullary. And I had a girl who had a, a bad knee subluxation that we just had to abandon the lengthening of the femur because the knee became difficult to keep in the is, joint. Is it pretty obvious on the lateral? Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I can send you that kid. Yeah. To you. But the problem is, if you don't have a good pre, then it's hard. It's hard sometimes to look afterwards. Oh, it's a little bit. Well, we don't know. So it's really important to have that pre as well. How's the study go? Where's your study at? The counseling one. Mm -hmm. uh, we I think we've enrolled about five or six kids now. Uh, mm -hmm. In the I mean, we just started it a month ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but we're capturing all of our prenatal visits now. And are you are you looking at when? No, just prenatal, um, we have a, a questionnaire that they fill out about how much sort of anxiety that they have, and then a questionnaire about how they did, how helpful they thought it was, and then another one when they come in to see us. Mm -hmm. And then we have the same for kids that just come in de novo without any prenatal. And we're looking for 40 kids in each group um, to be able to compare. So we've got about five or six in the prenatal, and we've got a couple in the, in the de novo group. So I think that over the course of a year or two, we'll be able to get it. Um, are there a is there a large enough population that is being missed, or is it just that they're not coming for counseling? Are they? Yeah, I mean, we see I, probably three or four a week kids that come in with club feet that have not, not that that yeah. I mean, I'm not sure why. I mean, whether they just you know they get their prenatal ultrasound in the OB office and they don't look, or uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how 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 those prenatal ultrasounds go when you're doing it, you know. So the, you're saying more than half have not been picked up. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, there's a lot to come in. Uh, are they not picked up or are they not referred? Are they, like, I, I don't know specifically, yeah. I mean, I don't, uh, I mean, I, now we're asking them, but before we haven't asked them, yeah, so. Have you thought of the fetal connections newsletter? 
no, I don't think so. We need to do that. I mean, if we don't have people. Yes, I. Or maybe one. Because that is the mission. No, but you'll get it with us. Yeah, but I think even just the study of sound and what's really going on. You know, what can be done. Yeah. Yeah, that's fabulous. Yeah. I think it'll be. I think it'll be good. Yeah. Good information to know, certainly. Yeah. So we put out the newsletter electronically to all of the MFNs and our the different disciplines. Yeah. 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 I think this would be. I mean, it wouldn't have to be. The writing of it would be. Yeah. 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 Judy, that might. That might be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let me know. Happy to do it. Thanks. All right, no problem. How's your knee? Oh, yeah, I think I, uh, Eva's no pretty more. good anytime I we have them uh, and center them. Yeah. I told you how to do lower extremity abnormalities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I went to see a guy, I went to see the guy at GW. You know, he said he could scope it and scrape it and clean it up. Yeah. Look at that. He gave me.